Before we get into Exodus, we're going to talk about expositional preaching, uh, which if you don't know what that is, that's just what we do, what I do, and what you engage in by the, the act of listening every Sunday. So, so as we study, why do we do certain parts of our worship? Why do we structure the worship service the way we do? Is it intentional? The, the, the loud cry has been, yes, it is all very carefully biblically reasoned, historically informed, intentional, what we do as the people of God. We believe in the regulative principle, meaning that God orders his worship in a way that he doesn't order your, your employment and he doesn't order the, 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 the things you do in your household quite so stringently and carefully as he orders the worship of his son in holiness. So today we ask the question, why expositional preaching? Now, if it, for some of you, expositional preaching is, well, for all, this is what it means. It's basically open up the word, read a section, explain it, apply it to our lives, and show us all how Jesus fulfills it. Or, so we read it, we explain it, we apply it, and then we point it to Jesus. That's expositional preaching. Now, for some of you, you've grown up in certain traditions or denominations where that is, that's your bread and butter. That just sounds like preaching. Like, what else would you do on a Sunday when you gather anyway than do exactly that? For others of you, it has been a welcomed change from such things as Church, the Lord's put something on my heart. And Mikhail, can we just get the lights turned down a little bit? The Lord's given me a message to share with you, and it's about giving or something like that, usually. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a welcome change from maybe what you've been used to, which is, which is uh, manned ideas. But what our conviction is that the Word of God has been written by God with the intention of being the main source of nutrients and food for the church of God. In other words, the Bible is not a condiment. We add a little bit too on the side of our talking. The Bible is not something that we sprinkle on top of our man-born messages where I tell you how I feel and a vision God's given me and, and some good wisdom from some, uh, from some wise men on the internet. And we don't do that and then sprinkle some Bible and go, you know, there's a verse that says this or somewhere in the Old Testament it says this or, or you remember that verse. We don't do that. We go to the Bible, we read it, we expound it and apply it to our lives and point it to Jesus. That is expositional preaching or expository preaching. That's our conviction. Now, you might wonder, where did this come from? This is a great idea. Whoever that came up with this, was it Calvin? Was it John the Reformed Baptist? Who did this? Because this is a great invention. Did we come up? Maybe you've come to hope rather recently, and this, is, this has been a welcome change for you, and you say, these guys have just got it right. They've figured it out. Amen? No, 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 no. We are historically informed, biblically based. We just do what we have been handed down from previous generations of warrior Christians and what we see in the Bible. That's all we do. We try to not do anything novel. So did we come up with expositional preaching? No. We actually see it all throughout the scripture that God's men of God or, or the, the men who are set apart for the preaching of the, uh, for his, his ministry were preachers. They would take the word of God and explain it because God always intended his word to be preached and applied to every generation of the church, if I can use that word uh, loosely, the Old Testament church, the New Testament church, the church into the future. We see this as early, for example, one of the clearest places we see this is in Nehemiah chapter 8. When Ezra the scribe has come back into, after the exile, he's come back over the people of God, they've rebuilt the temple, they've rebuilt the wall, and he leads what is a bit of a, a, a revival as the people are convicted of their sin and as they, they consecrate themselves to God. But there's this section in Nehemiah 8 that reads like this. He gathered all the people as one man into the square before the gate. And he commanded that they bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So he gets everybody together, check. He gets the scrolls and the scriptures given by the prophets, check. That's what we got right here. It says that he, uh, uh, in verse 3, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. I like that idea. We'll see how, we'll see whether you're here at 6 a.m. next week. He read from the scripture all morning in the presence of the men and the women and all those who could understand. So men, women, 
and the kids old enough to be able to comprehend what's going on. <clears throat> Look at the end of verse 3. And the ears of all... Well, you might not have it open in front of you, but at least listen. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. Check. All right, we've got a stage so that more people can hear and be visible. Verse 5. And Ezra opens the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. That's why we, we stand when we read sometimes. <coughs> Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen. Give it a try. Amen and Amen. amen. He says then in verse 8, uh, sorry, in verse 7, the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God. Clearly, they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. This is the purpose of the Bible. Not just to be individualistic books that we study, but primarily to be a preached book as it is opened in large amounts, explained, applied, and pointed to the ultimate purposes of God in Jesus Christ. We see the exact same thing picked up on what we see in, uh, in Ezra by example. We see in Paul by explicit command. And he says in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, I charge you, he's speaking to Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. He says... Uh, Verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. So, so when they want the word, preach them the word. And when they don't want the word, preach them the word so that their hearts change and they want the word or they find somewhere else to go. The preaching of the word in large, uh, in continual uh, uh, Sunday in, Sunday out, in its correct context and biblically understood, that is the meat and veg of the Christian life. That's what makes up our feast. So that's what we give the, the great most portion of time to when we gather on a Sunday morning. So how can you, how can you be a, uh, a, a faithful hearer of the word of God? If you're looking for historical, I did forget to say this, if you're looking for historical sort of basis, this was, this was the continual practice of the early church, scripture upon scripture being read and explained. There is a, there is a, a, a Latin term called lectio continua, you won't be quizzed on this, it just sounds nerdy if you want to remember it and use it, lectio continua, which is basically the practice of not just picking any text and expositionally preaching it, but just going through line by line through books of the Bible. Now, by and large, 90% of the time, that's what we do. Topical series sometimes, mostly we go through the books so that you can be sure and I can be sure that whatever's being taught is in its context, is being uh, preached along with the texts around it and the hard texts all get preached and cannot be avoided. This was the practice of the likes of John Chrysostom. It was a lot in the early church and many, many others. It was largely lost in the medieval period, largely not entirely, and then picked up on by the reformers. There's this funny story where John Calvin was preaching, and he got to a verse, and he stood down and, uh, 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 after preaching, and then that week he was kicked out of the city by city officials. And then two or so years later, he was called back, to be pastor, and so he ascended the pulpit steps, opened up the Bible to the exact same verse, and just said, now where were we? <clears throat> Lectio continua, just line by line through the books of the Bible. Now, how can you listen to the Word of God rightly? Number one, with faith. Believe. This is the word of God to us. He's not thundering on a mountain anymore. He's meeting us and speaking to us through the Bible correctly understood. Here with humility. No matter how, how, how great your Christian life is going, there will always be something. Every Sunday that you come, there will be something to repent of. Something that you need to change. Come with the heart of obedience. That is to say, not just what can I learn but what must I do this week? How can I be more obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ? And also, here with 
hearty agreement. That is that it's perfectly fine. In fact, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to do a whole little section on saying the amens. That's, a, that's an element that I think is commanded in the Bible, that we should be amening, hallelujahing, a chorus of people engaged in the hearing. So feel free. You got a little bit of Pentecostal in you? Bring it out. You got a little bit of a gospel choir or a little bit of Southern Baptist? Whatever. You bring those amens and hallelujahs. Just let me do the preaching. That's the only rule. You, you do the amening, the hallelujahs, I'll do the preaching. I won't be needing help with that. Let's, um, let's all just stand in reverence for the word of God. And in th- if you've got a, a baby or something's making it hard, don't worry about it. But, but the, the most of us, let's stand in reverence and thanks to the Lord God. Let's pray. Father God, we gather and we know that there's two classes of people in the world. There's, there's those who have your word and those who are in the darkness. And, and, and we are so apt to forget our privileges, forget our blessings, forget your grace to us, just like the Israelites in the wilderness. We are, we are a unique people, not this church alone, but your church across the world. There is such a thing as the voice of the creator in the creation. And it is given to us in this world, in time, space, history, in this book, this marvelous, amazing, translated, copied, preserved this blessed book, Lord God, it is a light in a dark generation. It is a feast in a wilderness. It is the waters that make these trees grow. It is a quench to our thirst. Father God, we thank you for the word. We ask for your forgiveness for the times that we are, we are cheapening of your word or we neglect your word or we, we listen half-heartedly during the preaching or, or when it is preached without full zeal and faith. Father God, we trust that as Ezra saw, as the Lord Jesus saw, as Paul the Apostle saw and commanded, as the Reformation saw, Father God, this has been your act throughout history that when your word is preached, it is like a rain on dry land and it brings forth life. We come thirsty and needy. Would you now, Lord God, enable us to hear with faith, humility, obedience, and rejoicing. And everybody said...